Irving sees it. Around the horn, let's go. Remember when I used to rhyme around the horn with, with everything? And then that was my friend. A topic to confound the horn. Let's go. We had a, a great opportunity to um, do some special things, but it was cut short um, just based off personal reasons for, on my end. And I know sometimes in sports, it's literally about the end goal and result and what you accomplish. And that's one thing. But we're still human at the end of the day. And uh, I wasn't my best self during that time. So when I look back on it, I just see it as a time where I learned how to let go of things and learned how to talk through my emotion. Perhaps there are those who believe this is a revenge story. Maybe the Boston fans do. Revenge compounds the horn. For Irving and for the words he just said, J.A. and Don, they had you hear it. And what effect, if any, do you see his return to Boston having in the NBA Finals games? Well, I, I hear it as authentic and genuine growth. And in order to grow, you have to acknowledge where you went wrong. And I think he did plenty of that. Uh, particularly talking about when he went back there with the Nets and the way he behaved and flipping off the fans, you know, that was counterproductive. He acknowledges that now. Uh, he acknowledges that, you know, he wasn't capable of doing and living up to the expectations that the Celtics and their fans had for him. You know, he was going through some personal things. His grandmother had, had passed away and, you know, he was 25, 26 years old. A lot of the greats in the NBA weren't ready to lead a team to a championship at that age. So, you know, he, he's in a much better place now. The question is, have the, the, the fans grown? You know, will, will they show the same level of growth? Will they not throw things? Will they not go beyond, you know, the mm. boundary of booing, which is, mm. which is fine. Just, just don't take it beyond that. Don't start throwing things like they have in the past when he's returned. All right. So, so you're looking at, as a growth potential here for both Irving and maybe for the fans in Boston, whether we see that. Jay, nice. I appreciate your optimism. Harry Lyles Jr., how'd you hear Kyrie Irving there? Yeah, I would perhaps not be as optimistic about the Boston fans acting a little bit more normal, uh, especially because even though, to your point, Kyrie clearly has matured from his time in Boston, I personally never expected to hear him say anything remotely close to this leading up to this week. And it's really because I didn't think he owed it to anybody necessarily, but I think it is concrete evidence that he has grown as a person. I thought the really key piece of this was him talking about his emotional issues and, and dealing with those. And I think that's going to be key as it pertains to this series because Dallas, their game has traveled well. They are 7-2 and two on the road in the postseason. That's been one of the best of any team this postseason. And we know Boston has their issues at home during the postseason. They're playing about 500 basketball in TD Garden. So yeah. as it pertains to the on-the-court things, Kyrie's growth as a person could very much help them win this series. Kevin Clark, how did you hear Kyrie Irving? Yeah, Celtics fans can boo. I'll never police fans. They don't need to mature. They don't need to grow. That's what fans do. But one truism in sports is that playing well can always lead to a path to redemption. Always. Notice it said a path because you still can't be a jerk about it. And Kyrie is accepting some responsibility here. He's saying this is not a reflection of who I am. I agree with that. What is his basketball destiny? He's coming into it. It's to be one of the two best Robins of his generation, along with Clay. We're seeing that right now. The one thing to worry about from a basketball perspective, he's lost 10 straight games to the Boston Celtics. That's what I'd worry about more than mm -hmm, any of this. But mm -hmm. I think this is, a, a, as Jay said, a basketball maturity, an off-court maturity. I think we're seeing it, but it's coming through a path from being in a good place from a basketball This standpoint. is the third time he's meeting the Celtics in the playoffs since leaving Boston and stepping on Lockie and the Staging the court and all these things, Bill Plaschke. How did you hear Irving? And what effect, if any, do you think it'll have on games, this, this rivalry? I loved hearing Kyrie Irving. Two years ago, I wrote a column for the LA Times saying that Kyrie should not come to LA, should not be a Laker. He's terrible, that they don't need him. I would not write that same column today. Mm -hmm. He's grown okay. up and he's really, he's I really sure. You said it wasn't that, my Bill. best self. Mm -hmm. He's admitted I wasn't my best self. I think he's already won. I don't think, I think it takes all the pressure off of him. I think it, because he, he's, he's already shown maturity, he's shown growth, he's shown, the, he, you know, he's uh, a, a man in all this. And I think the Boston fans aren't going to like him. They're already chanting, believe Kyrie, even against the Pacers. Mm -hmm. So the, the, they're ready but for But even him, that, think, once again, I mean, fans can boo and bleep Kyrie. Well, you may, you may debate the, the actual phrasing there, but we understand what that is. Uh, a tiny quibble with you, up. Kevin, about the redemption is if you play well. He's had a good year. It doesn't take away anything from the year before or the year before. But these words I hear from everybody here, these words are at least a step 
towards that. Adonde, I'll give you the last word. Well, the key question is whether the Celtics have grown from their previous trip to the finals. I think that's going to be the story of this. If the Celtics have shown that they learned from their shortcomings when they played the Warriors and they're a better team, but, you know, they weren't ready to play and perform on that stage. Yeah, there's, there's always that sports, you know, debate topic that comes up. Who needs it more? Who's got more pressure on them? I don't personally believe in that sort of thing. But when you consider, Jay, Kyrie Irving or then Jason Tatum, it's a basketball pressure situation to get through there. Do you have an answer to that question? It's clearly Jason Tatum. Kyrie Irving does have a championship, hit one of the great shots in NBA history to get it. Harry Lyles, do you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. All right, we'll be horny. We'll be moving on. Football now. News from Dallas. C.D. Lamb not in attendance for the Cowboys' first day of minicamp. He's still seeking a contract extension. Same true for Brandon Ayuk for San Francisco, missing their camp today, awaiting a new deal. Meanwhile, 49er teammate Christian McCaffrey, notably getting a contract extension today, two years, $19 million. Earlier this week, we talked about Justin Jefferson, a receiver in his contract extension, and many others in this offseason. Kevin Clark, what do the receiver absences mean to you today? For the Cowboys, it means everything. All the Cowboys are looking for is something very simple, very easy. They are looking for a receiving uh, contract to market to crash for the first time in history for the last 30 years in salary <laughs> okay, cap yeah, started yeah. it's gone up every yeah. single day every yeah. single week and the cowboys said well wait what if it's different this time what if between the justin jefferson and city lamb contract we start to crash no it's not going to happen this is how they do business for everything they lose every single standoff for the player <laughs> they want to keep going back to dak prescott going back to zeke elliott this is football malpractice. I can't believe they waited this long. They are living in the bed. Okay, that that's made. a take there. Is, that's your opinion. The Cowboys are not playing this right. When it comes to Lamb versus Jefferson, per se, you believe that's an even, even matchup there as no. far? Would you say Jefferson's a better receiver, deserves more money? Would you say the yeah, Cowboys Je need Lamb more? What would you say? Jefferson is a better player, but as this goes on, Lamb gets closer and closer to Jefferson money because of how the Cowboys are playing this. That's just the reality of football. Devontae Smith, you, know, you talk about the other teams in the NFL, Devontae Smith got a way below market extension because he was signed months ago. That's how this work works. The price is always going up. Yesterday's price is not today's price, and that's what we're dealing with. Bill Blasky, I turn to you here. L Lamb has four more catches than Jefferson in the last four years, so Lamb has been every bit as mm -hmm. equal. Okay. And, and since April, days. the top the top three contracts in the history of wide receivers have been given out. So, of course, these guys are going to hold out. Of course, they're going to sit out. Of course, they're not going to show up. But, of course, they're going to be signed. I'm not thinking this, this is a big deal at all. This, this, will, this will work itself out. It always does. Especially wide receivers are so important right now. Yeah, it'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, and it's, it's not just the ceiling, that $140 million that Jefferson signed. I think the floor is the $120 million that Amon Ra uh, St. Brown signed. So, you know, somewhere in between, I think, would be a fair price. Mm. And the question is, are the Cowboys going to be willing to meet him? Meanwhile, shout out to Christian McCaffrey. Other running backs have to, to have to beg and have to form alliances and threaten to go on strike to get extensions. And he was already the highest paid running backs. And they just said, hey, want some more? Let's break it off for and you. Harry Lyles Jr. C.D. Lamb might have a few more catches than Justin Jefferson, but Justin Jefferson's got about 700 more yards, and that absolutely amounts to something. The thing that just sticks out to me about this entire thing and is sort of piggybacks off of what Kevin was talking about, which, funny enough, Kevin was my GM when we did the NFL draft show, and I asked him, hey, Kevin, like, if you're the Cowboys, what do you do here? He's like, couldn't tell you because they don't really have a GM. So, like, this is an extension <laughs> of that. This team has sat and watched a player that is statistically comparable to Justin Jefferson, who I think most people would agree is not as good as Justin Jefferson. Justin Jefferson just got the most amount of money that a non-quarterback has ever made. And now if you're the Dallas Cowboys, you have somebody on your team that is looking at that and saying, I deserve just as much as that, if not more. And that's a problem. And you didn't, it didn't have to be this way. But that we know how this works. It's this. not just about who is better. The Cowboys are in a win-now mode, right? And maybe you would say the Vikings could surprise some people this year, but the Cowboys have to believe Need to be in a pay this now is the mode. year to make the Super Bowl, <laughs> as they always believe, and then that's a pay-now mode. <laughs> Who gets the point? Lyles for bringing up Clark's take or Clark for having the take initially? I'm going to Lyles because Clark well, had his opportunity. Oh, I'm going to Clark. To oh, no, the... Tony, you got to go to Clark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. One more story here. On the day MLB officially closed and cleared Shohei Otani and Ipe Mizuhara's gambling matter, another gambling story for baseball. Padres took a Peter Marcano lifetime ban. League finding best made last year when he was on the IL but still a pirate. 
games the Pirates were playing. He was waived last year. He's still recovering from his injury, so he hasn't played for San Diego this year. But a lifetime ban. Bill Plaschke, how significant is this for baseball? There's a name in here that should scare the heck out of baseball. It's Pete Rose. This is the first lifetime ban since Pete Rose. We're getting into Pete Rose territory. This is serious business. This is base baseball needs to tell us players you cannot bet on sports, period. These players have more access to casinos. Heck, the Pirates, when they stay in St. Louis, they stay at a casino. Mm-hmm. They have more access to betting, more off time, more danger, more trouble. Do we there. believe players gotta... don't know that, Bill? I mean, you're saying that baseball has to tell them. Do we believe? Uh, we recognize the world is different and betting is much more available. But it's so hard when you're in a casino playing blackjack, you want to throw, 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 throw down a few bucks on a baseball game. I think you're human beings. I think you've got to ban, base, you got to ban betting for all baseball. Hey, Dante. Bill, I mean, you mentioned Pete Rose. This is nowhere near as momentous. You're talking about a player with 88 career hits as opposed to a player with 4,256 <laughs> career hits. I mean, but, Pete but, Rose is always going to be the, the standard here. And, and, and the warning sign, and, and the bad part is that the warning wasn't heated, right? The, the lesson, the morality lesson uh, was not heated. You do wonder, though, if baseball needs some type of, of sliding scale. I mean, some of these other uh, players that were, that were suspended, Today, the announcement was made today. I mean, we're talking about less than $500 in bets, you know, and I know it's about, you know, the appearance and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. trying to maintain and preserve integrity, but you have to wonder if sometimes baseball. So you think it should be done on a dollar value? How preserve. much they lost or how much they won or how much they bet? That's interesting. It's not us. all the same. Harry Lyles Jr., I turn to you. It's all the same, Jay. To me, this is, this is pretty basic. This is just an extension of one of Major League Baseball's biggest problems that they have had for decades, which is a credibility issue. Obviously, Pete Rose, that was one thing. The steroid era was another. And you still have guys now gambling on the game. Whether or not he has 4,000 hits or does not, does not matter. It is drawing direct people to say, we are questioning the integrity of your game. That in itself is an issue. And the bigger issue, and you've all sort of opened up this can of worms, is that it is easier now to gamble than it has ever been. And Kevin, does it matter that it's a player who, who's on the, on the brink of being a player in the league? No, it doesn't. You cannot bet on baseball. This has to be clear. It has to send a chill down the spine of everybody who's even thinking about it. But a guy like Michael Kelly placed $99 worth of bets and cost himself $740,000 in salary. If you, if you bet, you will get caught. They need to learn that. Taking a break. Buy or sell next. People are talking about women's basketball, but you never would think that we'd be talking about women's basketball. People are pulling up to games. We got celebrities coming to games, sold out arenas, like just because of one single game. And just looking at that, like I'll take that role. I'll take the bad guy role, and I'll continue to take that on and be that for, the, for my teammates. And if I want to be that, and I know I'll go down to history, I'll look back in 20 years and be like, yeah, the reason why we watching women's basketball is not just because of one person. It's because of me too, and I want y'all to realize that. Like, it's not just because of one person. A lot of us have done so much for this game, and Kennedy has been here before, obviously, but there are so many great players in this league that have deserved this for a really, really long time, and luckily, it's coming now. Angel Reese, that sound which you heard yesterday. Maybe you only heard the first part of it when it made the rounds, so we play it full here. It came from Chicago Sky Media Availability. More from that, Kennedy Carter saying she's more than what just aired on that clip and there was also a longer part of the play as well that should be seen her no comments at the podium but then comments on threads and reese's reaction on the bench were something yesterday's panel also viewed in the greater lens i'll ask a panel today that also should include our monica mcnutt you know monica mcnutt from everywhere and of course everything that she's done to earn this for herself How the players in the league feel, Monica, about the league right now and about Caitlin Clark specifically has been something everyone seemingly wants to weigh in. Here's the voice of the players involved. How do you hear the Sky players? Uh, Tony, I hear fatigue. I'll be honest. I am not condoning what Kennedy Carter did. Her head coach, Teresa Weatherspoon, said that that's not the character of the Chicago Sky. And Kennedy Carter, while she sort of danced around it in the name of competition and emotions, she knows that that wasn't a basketball play. But as we continue to talk about this league and its growth, Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark are always going to be linked. But so much of this conversation has been about what Caitlin Clark is experiencing, and we've not discussed Angel Reese being part of a rebuilding Chicago Sky team. I hear fatigue in that sound. You hear fatigue. Reese specifically. That video went around. It was about her saying, I'm here, me too. The full clip we hear as well. How did you hear it specifically? 
In the full clip, I think she does a good job of acknowledging that while Clark is a part, well, she didn't necessarily acknowledge, but acknowledging that there's one player that is dominating the headlines, but we're talking about an entire league, 144 women that are the best at their craft. Yes, this rookie class, Clark and Reese in particular, have big time following when you talk about social media, but they are joining other women that have been working for this moment and to earn this level of coverage. Bill Plask, I'll bring you in here on how you heard the Sky players yesterday. I think the key quote was when she said, the reason we're watching women's college basketball is not just because of one person, it's because of me too. She's singling herself out. It's like the whole league feels that way. It feels, seems to me like the whole league feels ignored and they feel and through this being ignored, it, it manifests itself in resentment that has manifested itself You had on said the court. this last week when we talked about this too. That yeah, and, and, I, I, and I feel this is real. Now, I, my own opinion here, the, the projection here of jealousy, right? That's not a word we would use in other sports in the jealousy. NBA. No, no, jealousy. I understand that. But we've also heard the coach of Minnesota, Cheryl Reeves, say more than one player in a tweet the first game of the season. Don, I'll turn to you on how you heard the Sky players. Well, I heard people, two, two players who wanted to get their side out, but also say, you know, you have the chance to do it. Part of that is fulfilling your media obligations. Angel Reese didn't meet with the media after the game. And Kennedy had that, that next question response, basically, when asked about the shove. You know, I, I would like to advance the, the conversation and get back to basketball. So my hot take coming out of the Sky Fever game was that Carmila Cardoso was the most impressive rookie on the court. 18 minutes in her first game back from injury, 11.6 rebounds plus 11. Basketball. Ira Lyles, Jr. So I'm starting with Kennedy Carter. I think that obviously the play that she made was not a basketball play. We can all agree about that. And I think that she also understands that. I do think her point that she is more than just one clip or one play, I think that's important. And I think the reason that that reminder is important is because we do have a lot more people that are not typically women's basketball fans or WNBA fans parachuting in in part because people love drama and conflict in their sports. And this is the hottest thing that we've got right now. As it pertains to what Angel Reese was talking about, Caitlin Clark, yes, she is the biggest reason that you have all these new people watching the game. But Angel Reese, to her credit, is 100% correct in that she is a part of that because for that game, 1.5 million people tuned in, which was the fourth most watched game over the last 22 years in WNBA history. And we already know the stats with their college games as well. So both Kennedy Carter and Angel Reese, I think, are in the right here and what they were trying to elaborate on. And Kevin Clark. Yeah, both Monica and Harry nailed this one. You cannot tell the story of Caitlin Clark today without Angel Reese. She is more correct than a lot of the pundits, I think, gave her credit for yesterday. Let a basketball rivalry be a basketball rivalry. I think the, the picture that a lot of pundits are painting right now is one of a very boring league. They want it to be boring. They don't want animosity on the court. This is what breeds mm. rivalries, real animosity. This league has genuine superstars. Some of them don't like each other. That's good for the sport. Let rivalries be rivalries. Monica, one follow-up then. The greater lens conversation, and this was invoked by people weighing in from the outside, but the idea of jealousy among players. Again, a word was used petty you're being petty and then to see no comments and then to see threads and then to hear this greater conversation your view of it Tony, I would just ask folks to be mindful of the power of their words when you're talking about a league that is predominantly black, right? These women sit at the intersection of identities as predominantly black and predominantly queer. And by no fault of her own, Caitlin Clark happens to be a white woman. Just be mindful of your words and make room for competition and the full range of human emotion. End of sports. Thank you for your time, Monica. We'll see you later in the week when you're here with us again. Bill Flashkey, J.A. Donde, Showdown next. I'm going with Monica. Time for one showdown French Open. Two huge developments. Novak Djokovic withdrawing with knee injury. And Coco Goff, a steely win over Ange Jabor, advancing to the semis to take on Iga Sviantek. How do you celebrate? By flossing in 2024. Coco Goff. Bill, what's your headline? Coco puffs her way to greatness. She's going to beat Sviantek. And, and it advanced to the finals. Shvantex won 19 straight in Garros. Wait, what did you she say at the start? 19. Did, did, did uh, Woody Page just take the space of Bill Flaschke here? You wanted the headline. I give you a headline. Okay, what's the headline, Jay Adonde? Uh, I usually I'm go, go, Coco, but, you know, losing Novak is, is just hard at this stage. We don't know how many French Opens he has left, and he still has something. You see him go for, like, full Spider-Man, spread legs, parallel to the, to the court to make that one shot yesterday, and I'm sad that we won't get to see him Give it another shot this year. All right, Bill Plasky, for the effort. You're getting off your losing streak. Take your first. Yes, I'm out of it. Thank you. So, Ronnie James is eligible for the 
NBA draft. And I know what you're thinking. And no, no, I know you were hoping, you're wondering, you're thinking, no, the Lakers should not take him under any circumstances. Not with number 17, that was number 55. Do not take him. There's too much pressure on the kid. Too much pressure on the organization. Imagine having to ask LeBron to send his son to the G League. Imagine uh, his son and LeBron in the same locker room. Everybody thinks the kid's a spy. It's not going to work out. It's going to be a nightmare. LeBron will be running the organization. It'll be running into the ground. The kid's not going to develop there. It's too much pressure, too much heat. Don't draft Ronnie. No. Wow, Bill Flashkey. No. Uh, FaceTime about L.A. What a shocker. Speaking of, you could have talked about another L.A. team, the Clippers. The opposite field. Walk-off home run for the Sooners. And the quest for a four-peat continues. Beth Mullins on the call. What a finish for the Sooners. Full highlights ahead is Oklahoma back in the national championship. Welcome into Sports Center. Kevin Nagani here for the next 90 minutes. We'll head live to Boston for new information on Chris Tapp's Porzingis' status for the NBA Finals. Plus, a very busy day around the NFL. Mandatory mini camps underway. New South from Tua today on his contract situation and why Tyreek Hill compared himself to a great Amazon driver. But we start with another contract situation. Let's follow this developing story, and it is in Dallas. Cowboys receiver CeeDee Lamb was not at the first day of mandatory minicamp, and Adam Schefter reports he's not expected to show up. He's seeking a contract extension, something a number of wide receivers have received this offseason, including the record-breaking one given to Justin Jefferson yesterday. And Lamb, well, he could be next. He was selected five spots just ahead of Jefferson in the first round of the 2020 draft. His 395 career catches are third most by a player in just their first four seasons in NFL history, and that is ahead of, guess who, yeah, Justin Jefferson. And he's fourth all-time in receiving yards through this point of his career. Here's his head coach addressing his absence earlier today. CD and, and, and all those types of situations. He's in a business situation. You know, everybody's engaged and I, I'm, I, I have no, no qualms or don't lack no confidence as far as, you know, our guy, our vets being ready. He's been engaged. I can, I can just tell you that. He's about to hit the brink truck. <laughs> <laughs> He's about to get his, you know. Uh, but I, I can't think of someone more deserving. You're talking about hand in hand. I think CD's, you know, the best receiver in the league. I mean, if Jefferson said it, I think yeah, you could argue that CD's better, however you want to put it. But um, CD should be right there with him. Micah knows about that money coming your way. Todd Archer is on the scene from the star in Frisco, Texas. And we've got our resident cowboy, Marcus Spears, with us. Todd, what's the buzz surrounding Lamb not being there at Cowboys OTAs? Yeah, Kevin, I don't think there was much of a surprise that CD wasn't around from the organization and his teammates, as you heard Micah say. Players understand the business side of these things, and they're supportive. You know, a year ago, Zach Martin went through a holdout during a portion of, of training camp, and he talked about the hardest part there is not being around your teammates, not knowing what the conversations are. He called it a stressful time, but in the end, he eventually got his deal. On the field for the Cowboys during this time, I, I, they're not worried about C.D. Lamb and, and what type of receiver he is. They, they know what he can do. This is more about the opportunity for younger receivers, Jalen Tolbert, Jalen Brooks, to build that comfort level with uh, Dak Prescott. And now on the contract front, you know, in the spring, Jerry Jones told us he wanted to see more leaves fall when it comes to the receiver's uh, position. Well, I don't know how many leaves are left to fall here, Kevin. There seems to be a path to get a deal done. And perhaps before they get to training camp in Oxnard, California, uh, July 23rd. By the way, timing is perfect here for CD. Last season, he became the first player yeah. in Cowboys history to lead the league in catches. Todd, thank you so much. Swagoo, we're a reasonable program here. So I understand <laughs> it is early June. At what point does it become a concern that C.D. Lamb isn't there at the facility? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, Kev, the leaves didn't fall. The whole damn tree fell when <laughs> Justin shook. Jefferson signed that contract. <laughs> my man, uh, T.A., Todd Archer, one of my good friends in this business, man. Uh, training camp, Kev. Uh, if if, if C.D. is not done or they are not nearing something the first couple of days within training camp, 
I'll start to get nervous about it because now you start talking about maybe some separation on the dollar amount and value. And that's always the case, Kev. Is it a value discussion in which it's taking these uh, talks so long or is it just a structure uh, situation? And it could be with the Dallas Cowboys. Obviously, we know about that Prescott situation with his contract. We know that Micah Parsons is coming up. Steven Jones has talked about that in the offseason about how do you pay all three of these guys and keep them all happy. So you hope that it's the way that they have to structure this contract and which is why it's taking a minute as opposed to being separated on the value. Because if you're separated on the value and CeeDee Lamb and his team is sitting there and they watch Justin Jefferson, what he just did in Minnesota, they know that Jamar Chase is going to come down the pipe. You absolutely feel like your guy is one of those guys in the upper echelon and the same tier. Then it becomes a real issue. So hopefully this is structure and not value. Okay, you talk about training camp. Just keep in mind here, seven weeks from today, it's believed the Cowboys will begin practice in training camp for the 2024 season. So, again, we've got plenty of time, just around 50 days. Yep. We'll see how this continues to play out specifically for that contract. Marcus Spears hanging out with us tonight. Another development has slimmed down Tua Tagovailoa showing up to Dolphins minicamp. Now, Tua says he'll be more nimble without the extra LBs, but he's hoping his paycheck 